Uh, now, finally, uh, for this session, please welcome Dr. Jean Bowman, who is Head of Nutrition and Brain Health at the Nestle Institute of Health Sciences. Dr. Bowman is going to talk about novel therapeutic nutrition. Dr. Bowman. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers uh, and also Andrea for the invitation to come speak. And I think in the context of what we've heard in these excellent talks, um, I suppose I'm bringing the angle of nutrition science uh, within the clinical neurosciences here. I wanted to quickly just show you where our institute lies because we are local. Uh, I actually walked here from the circle close to the lake where our institute is over to the Swiss Tech Center. Uh, this is a nice picture, I guess, a bird's eye view, but maybe uh, potentially a drone's eye view uh, by Alan Herzog. Um, and I wanted to just briefly just show you that we are focused out not only in brain health at the Institute, but also in gut and microbiome health, uh, muscle aging, and metabolic health. And our director, Ed Beji, Dr. Beige has set up a remarkable uh, uh, institute that has tremendous capacities from omics technologies to data integration and analytics uh, and profiling systems to stem cell biology and flow cytometry. Uh, and all of this uh, will lead to information that we can use to translate or at least build knowledge to, to develop nutritional therapies in these key indication areas. Now, moving on to cognitive aging, uh, this paper by Weintraub, I think, recapitulates an interesting phenomenon that, that cognitive aging or the effects of age are not uh, homogeneous in terms of the cognitive domain of interest. Here we see on the left graph that language uh, accelerates both vocabulary and, leading, and reading uh, up until about age 30, and then really remains stable with aging, whereas memory is, is quite different. Uh, you see maturation of, of uh, short-term memory abilities up until about age 30, and then they start declining, where you see a, uh, an individual at age 80, for example, in terms of short-term memory has the same performance as a, as a 10-year-old. So this is important in terms of developing therapies and at what time point you want to actually intervene. For example, if you're focused on cognitive development, um, and, and even in late ages, uh, you may want to, to think about the timing of when you want to start this intervention. Now, this is something that's been uh, captured by multiple of the speakers, uh, and it's a slide that's been used tremendously, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I think over the last 25 years, the field has made tremendous progress in a couple areas, perhaps not in the therapy area, and I think that's why we're here, but certainly in the terms of understanding environmental and genetic risk factors and the natural history of the disease. As many of the other speakers said, that we know now that the, the neurobiology that's disturbed happens years, if not decades, before the clinical symptoms are onset. And the field has done a good job of identifying stages for intervention, here showing primary prevention, where we're, we're aiming to delay the onset of Alzheimer's disease pathology itself. Um, secondary prevention, which is basically focused on people that have risk factors or signs of amyloid pathology in the brain, and that would fall here in this preclinical stage. And then where most of the trials uh, have been taking place is in this tertiary area, in the mild cognitive impairment or full-blown Alzheimer's trying to slow the progression. And I think we're learning now, particularly in therapies that are focused on the classic neurobiology of the disease, uh, that this is way too late uh, to begin. So the other area is that we've learned a lot about genetics uh, in the field. So certainly we know the genes that are related to the familial cause of the disease. We know the, the primary risk genes that are involved, and I've just highlighted a few here for, I know this is a mixed crowd of the general public, but you see some common themes in terms of the, the top 10 genes that are, are risk loci uh, around lipid metabolism or cell protein, protein trafficking, including APP and amyloid uh, processing, but also related to inflammation. So that's interesting from a therapy standpoint. And then I wanted to bring up subcortical small vessel disease because you know, this vascular contribution to cognitive decline, I think, is, is, is beginning to get more attention, but I think it deserves more attention. And we even know about some key genes related to white matter hyperintensities or more of these ischemic changes that occur in the brain that are relevant to cognitive decline. Well-established risk factors for Alzheimer's dementia, I just wanted to put these out there. Our older age, APOE genotype that we just talked about is by far the, the strongest uh, risk factor in terms of genetics. Head injury, low cognitive and physical engagement. And then a, a host of cardiovascular risk factors, both hypertension, diabetes, alcohol consumption, depression, midlife obesity, and midlife hypercholesterolemia. 
In terms of the areas and what we're focused on, this is a, a paper that we just uh, published in, in, in Nature just uh, a couple months ago uh, that has this table here in terms of what are the key biological targets from a nutritional standpoint that are relevant to cognitive decline in Alzheimer's disease. And these are some key areas that we think are important. This includes uh, both cerebral energy deficits, uh, the classic hallmarks of the disease, tau and amyloid uh, uh, dysmetabolism. Of course, we're trying to reverse the epigenetics that lead to, to Alzheimer's disease. Synaptic dysfunction, neurovascular dysfunction or blood-brain barrier dysfunction, and then inflammation. Now, how do we go about this? Uh, so our research framework is that uh, we have several areas, our preclinical area that's headed up by Pascal Steiner in our group at the Institute. Uh, we have human-derived iPS cell lines that can recapitulate the disease uh, in a dish that gives us a, a more workable model where we can test things and do bio, uh, bioactive screening and also pinpoint the, the modes of action. Um, and then we also tap into clinical cohorts uh, where we do molecular and, and functional genetic work in these large epidemiological studies. And we, we apply computational models and we translate this information into clinical trials. And in the green, this is where it feeds into our businesses where we get into development and deployment where we're either focused on consumer health or medical nutrition or novel therapeutic nutrition, which is more of the drug route. So I just wanted to give you a flavor of some of the, the new research that, that we have going. This is a collaboration at the SHUV with Dr. Julius Pop and the um, uh, Center for Leonards, the memory center there. And we've characterized a cohort of 118 individuals with a mean age of 70 and a mini mental of 26. 31% um, are carrying the APOE4 genotype. And we were asking the question, because this is a bio biomarker discovery project, whether or not uh, blood-brain blood -brain barrier impairment is relevant to cognition and whether or not we could identify a biomarker profile that would predict that. And indeed, we were able to show here that BBB breakdown is functionally relevant to cognition. This is showing basically a, a clinical dementia rating of 0, 0 0.5, and 1, which represents cognitively intact, mild cognitive impairment, and Alzheimer's disease. And we see that cognitively intact have much better uh, blood-brain barrier function than those in the MCI or Alzheimer's, but not different between MCI and Alzheimer's, suggesting that this is an earlier phenomenon. We've also identified uh, a CSF profile uh, that, that can predict uh, those, those subjects that have blood-brain barrier dysfunction uh, with a diagnostic accuracy of 92%. And I can't share what those are at this point, uh, but I'll come back to this later. Another cohort that we've tapped into and done well characterized studies over the years uh, is the Oregon Brain Aging Study. This is a longitudinal cohort, and I don't have time to go into this, but this is a study of exceptionally healthy oldest old, okay? And at the mean age of 87 and um, uh, a mini mental of, of about 26. Um, and basically what we did here is we wanted to identify nutritional biomarkers in the blood and take a computational approach to this to capture more synergistic features. So we modeled this using principal component analysis and we identified distinct nutrient biomarker patterns. And then we wanted to test whether or not these are relevant to known outcomes in the field, cognition and volumetric MRI. And I don't have time to go into a lot of the details, but this summarizes some of the results where each of the rows is showing each distinct nutrient biomarker pattern in each um, column is representing a, a cognitive composite and the global score or, or the actual domain specific. And green is, rec is uh, resembling a favorable result and red is showing an unfavorable result. And this, this one pattern, this BCDE, which is a combination of, of B1, B2, B6, B7, B9, uh, vitamin C and E, and vitamin D was really the most profound protective uh, biomarker pattern that we identified. And of course, the trans fat pattern was on the other side. So, so people that had higher levels of trans fat in circulation really had worse memory, attention, language processing, it really across the board. What we're looking here is consistency across, okay? So we want to see that that the biomarker pattern is relevant to not only cognition, but also to the MRI measures of brain aging. And there's a few that do. So for example, the omega-3s seem to be only related to executive function and white matter lesions that I represent, that I was talking about earlier. The BCDE pattern uh, to global cognitive function and also total brain atrophy. And the trans fat pattern related to uh, global cognitive function and, and more brain atrophy. So, 
But how, how relevant is nutrition? You know, a lot of people have said, oh, the effects of nutrition is, is really relatively small. I think that's probably due to the tools that we've had available to us. And, and one of the things that Ed Bezier is doing at the Institute is really the vision is trying to unlock the power of nutrition using hardcore science in a sense. And, and one way to get at this uh, is, is, is shown here, where if you look at in this cohort of global cognitive function, we know that age, gender, education, APOE genotype, hypertension, depression explains about 46% of the variability in global cognitive function in an older population. Now, if we add the nutrient biomarker patterns to that, we can explain an additional 17% of variability in, in global cognitive function. If we look at the, the total brain volume, we use the MRI measures, it's even more dramatic, where those same covariates of age, gender, APOE genotype, hypertension, diabetes, explains about 40% of the total variation in total brain volume. And you add the, the nutrient biomarker patterns, and you can almost double that. So then you're up to about 77% of the total variation in total brain volume using nutrient biomarker patterns and the classic risk factors, modifiable and unfightable risk factors. So I think this begins to make the case that, that nutrition is, is relevant to the brain. I wanted to highlight two projects that we uh, are collaborating in. A new one, this is uh, uh, called the MIND trial, uh, which uh, is, is being led by Martha Claire Morris at Rush University and Medical Center and, and also Frank Sachs at Harvard. This will be the, the largest dietary intervention to prevent cognitive decline to date with the primary outcome of, of cognitive function. Um, and it's targeting people age 65 and older that have a family history of Alzheimer's disease and also are overweight. And we have a more targeted nutritional intervention uh, that we're participating in. And this is an omega-3 trial where we identified in the previous studies that I showed you this interesting relationship between omega-3 fatty acids and white matter lesions in the brain. So this study actually will enrich people with high white matter lesions in the brain at baseline and also low omega-3 status and will actually intervene to see whether or not in a phase two setting we can modulate white matter hyperintensity accumulation over time um, uh, and whether or not that can prevent executive decline over time. So with that, uh, some of the findings that I presented here, we'll actually release all of these results. These are two accepted abstracts at the Alzheimer's Association International Conference being held in Toronto, and I just wanted to make you all aware that we have a uh, professional interest area now developed specifically on the science around nutrition, metabolism, and dementia that's set up at the Alzheimer's Association, and we have a featured research session there that's listed here. Uh, to be presented um, July 23rd. So if those of you that can make the trip to Toronto, please come. And then of course, none of this work gets done without uh, teams of people. So this is everybody that's uh, involved in research in brain health just at the Institute. And of course, we have other people, regulators at Nestle that are, that are involved. Uh, I'd like to thank um, also our collaborators at the Shuv and Quartz Bio in Geneva, uh, who does a lot of our analytics and of course, our academic collaborators. And with that, I'll stop and thank you for your time.